Greetings from Academy IAPSM eConnect. Myself, Dr. Arunima Sharma from Uttar Pradesh University of Medical Sciences, Sapai, Itawa. We, the team Combat Marvels, humbly present before you the 16th capsule of Public Health Update Series for the months October and November 2023. The contents of this video will be dealt within two parts. The first part will focus on first, the WHO IS app launch, second, World Health Summit 2023, third, Global TB Report 2023, fourth, New Standardized Protocol for County Management of Malnutrition. The other second part will focus on first, update on malaria 2023, second, WHO updated guidelines on treatment for COVID 19, third, Mental Health of Refugees and Migrants 2023, Fourth, new update on complementary feeding 2023. So, let's begin with the first part. Over to you, Dr. Akash. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Akash Arjadav, second year community medicine postgraduate from ESIC Medical College and Hospital Kalburgi. Let's begin with the first update. Globally, at least 2.2 billion people have a near or distance vision impairment. To draw the attention on vision impairment and blindness worldwide, on every second Thursday of October, the World Sight Day is observed. And for the year 2023, on 12th of October, WHO ICE, a free mobile application was launched for general public. The app checks for visual acuity by adapting the same clinical chart principles. The app is currently available in six United Nations languages. The WHO ICE Application comes with high accuracy, which is comparable to the clinical gold standard ETDRS chart that's being confirmed through this study. Now we'll look upon the app interface. As you can observe, the home tab has two options. One for long distance vision, which requires two people, while to test for short distance vision, the app requires single person. The application provides with five simple tips to take care of eyes and few frequently asked questions. It is important to note that the app does not replace the need for regular eye checks by an eye care professional, even if your vision is good. So coming to the second up, World Health Summit, which was hosted in Berlin on 15th of October, which comes with two major statements. That is, first, M8 Alliance Declaration, which calls for fair and strong multilateralism. And second, statement on green health. Coming to the first thing, M8 Alliance calls for three crucial developments to improve the global health and to respond to the growing threats from climate change. The three crucial challenges or the developments are move from fragmentation to cooperation and integration, address the disparities between the countries, address the needs for most vulnerable population. Second, statement for green health. The World Health Summit recognized that the health sector both national and local, has an important role to build better, more climate resilient and low carbon health systems, implement public health measures and to guide other sectors whose action impact substantially on health. Coming to the next update, World TV report was released on 7th of November 2023. According to the report, there was an encouraging recovery in number of people being diagnosed with TB and treated has started to reverse the damaging impact of pandemic. However, the world as a whole and most regions and countries are far from reaching the NTB strategy milestones and targets. Despite being preventable and usually curable, TB remains the world's second leading cause of death from a single infectious age in the year 2020, just after COVID-19. Now coming to the next update, new community management of malnutrition protocol launch was launched on 10th of October 2023 in a national event called Supposhit Bharat Sashak Bharat. It strengthens the ongoing commitment to address the challenges of malnutrition. The protocol it has 10 steps starting with growth monitoring and screening followed by appetite test for severe acute malnutrition, medical assessment, decision making regarding the level of care, Nutritional management followed by medical management, nutritional support and health education and counseling followed by home visits by Anganwadi worker and referral services reducing the decision regarding the duration of monitoring. Let's 
begin with the second part. So, the first topic is about the WHO guidelines for malaria. The latest World Malaria Report for 2021 indicates 247 million cases and 6,19,000 deaths globally. Malaria is preventable and treatable with a global focus on reducing disease burden and achieving long-term eradication. According to the WHO guideline, indoor residual spring is strongly recommended where vector populations primarily feed, rest, and sleep indoor. Majority structures are suitable for a spring and where one to two round of IRS per year can protect the population. However, the overall uh, certainty of evidence is very low based on the studies. Pre-qualified IRS products use various insecticide classes, excluding organochlorine IRS formulations, including DDT. Now comes the second update. The panel advises against the implementation of topical repellents for community level malaria control due to the lack of evidence of significant impact. Achieving effectiveness at the community level would require high individual compliance. The overall certainty of evidence as determined by the guideline development group is very low based on the available studies. Now, over to the next update of capsule. WHO updated guidelines on treatment for COVID-19. WHO has updated its 13th guideline for non-severe COVID-19 therapeutics. The updated risk estimates will assist healthcare professionals to identify individuals at high, moderate, or low risk of hospital admission and to tailor treatment accordingly. So, in high-risk category, 6% estimated hospitalization rate include immunosuppressed people. In moderate-risk category, 3% estimated hospitalization rate includes people more than 65 years old, those with the conditions like obesity, diabetes, chronic conditions, and those with comorbidities of chronic disease. In low risk category, but 5% estimated hospitalization rate, those who are not in the high or moderate risk categories are at low risk. Most belongs to this category. Then, review of COVID-19 treatment for people with non-severe COVID-19. Both in high and moderate risk categories, WHO strongly recommend nirmatrivir and ritonavir. In the case of low risk category, symptoms like fever and pain can be managed with analgesics like paracetamol. WHO recommended strongly against the use of any antiviral therapy for low risk, use of new antiviral and Ivermectin for the patients with non-severe COVID-19. Now, coming to the next update of the capsule, Mental Health of Refugees and Migrants. On World Mental Health Day, WHO emphasizes that good mental health is a right for all, including refugees and migrants. A new report, Mental Health of Refugees and Migrants, highlight five key themes for improved mental health care. First, community support by being the part of a community. Second, basic needs and security. Third, stigma, experiences of racism and discrimination. Fourth, adversity and trauma. Fifth, access to the services. They often lack awareness of freely available services or decline healthcare due to the language barrier or the concern about the confidentiality. Refugees and migrants may face unique stressors and challenges. Thus, there is an urgent need to set up policies and legislation. First, by promoting refugee and migrant participation in society and reducing discrimination. Second, by addressing the non-medical factors and prioritizing the basic needs like food, housing, safety, and education or employment that can impact mental health. Third, by training health workers and relevant professionals to assess and treat mental health conditions and by strengthening the capacity. Fourth, offering choices about the delivery of mental health services like location, service provider, and treatment approach to make access to the care possible and acceptable. Fifth, by safeguarding the human rights of all refugees and migrants, regardless of their legal status, to protect these populations from discrimination discrimination and violence and by strengthening the community capacity and access to the mental health care by providing information about the services. Now coming to the last update of section 2 of this capsule, WHO guideline for complementary feeding of infants and young children 
6 to 23 months of age. WHO guideline for complementary feeding of infants and young children offer global evidence-based recommendation for both breastfed and non-breastfed children in low, middle and high income countries. So, recommendation 1 that is continued breastfeeding. Breastfeeding should continue up to 2 years or beyond. To carry out this recommendation, all breastfeeding women requires an enabling supportive environment like on-site daycare, workplace breastfeeding room, flexible work schedule and breastfeeding counseling services to address the questions and challenges. Then recommendation 2 for infants 6 to 11 months, those not exclusively breastfed, either formula or full fat animal milk can be fed if safe storage and handling practices are followed. For children 12 to 23 months, animal milk is recommended for those not exclusively breastfed. Dairy products including liquid animal milk contribute to nutritional adequacy. However, follow-up formulas and flavored or sweetened milk are not recommended and deficiency. Then recommendation 4 that is dietary diversity in infants and young children. They, uh, they should consume a diverse diet like animal source food, fruits and vegetables should be consumed daily. Pulses, nuts and seeds should be consumed frequently and care should be taken to avoid the risk of choking. These foods are key components of energy intake due to their overall high nutrient density as compared to the cereal grains. The usage of whole cereal grains should be prioritized while the use of refined ones along with the starchy staple food should be minimized. Recommendation 5 that is unhealthy food and beverages. Foods high in sugar, salt and trans fat or sugar sweetened beverages or non-sugar sweeteners should not be consumed and the consumption of 100% fruit juice should also be limited. Broad policy actions regarding front of package labeling and market practices are needed along with counseling of caregivers about the short and long term harm of these foods. Now the recommendation 6 that is nutrient supplements and fortified food. When nutrient requirement cannot be met with unfortified foods alone, multiple micronutrient powders and small quantity lipid based nutrient supplements can provide additional vitamins and minerals. For population already consuming commercial cereal grain based complementary food and blended flours. Fortification of these cereal can improve micronutrient intake, although the consumption should not be encouraged. None of these products are a substitute or distributed as standalone interventions. Now comes the recommendation 7 that is responsive feeding. Children in this age group should be responsively fed, promoting autonomous eating in response to physiological and developmental needs fostering self-regulation and supporting cognitive, emotional and social development. Implementation requires healthcare worker to provide guidance to caregiver. Caregiver's time while the child eats or self-feed and the resources so that food loss during self-feeding does not present as a problem. Now, over to Dr. Akash for conclusion and vote of thanks. Thank you. We would like to conclude our public health update capsule for the month of October and November. At this point of time, we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the mentors and advisors who have helped us and guided us all the way. We would like to thank Dr. Akanksha ma'am, Dr. Girish sir, Dr. Swati ma'am, Dr. Ratnesh sir, Dr. Dipanshi ma'am for bringing us to the platform. We would like to extend our thanks to the complete eConnect team consisting of Dr. Wasim sir, Dr. Medha Ma'am, Dr. Archisman Sir, Dr. Parag Sir, Dr. Malatesh Sir. We would like to extend our sincere gratitude to the senior IAPSM member for their guidance and support. We would like to thank Dr. A.M. Kadri Sir, President IAPSM, Dr. Purushottam Giri Sir, Secretary General IAPSM, Dr. Harivan Chopra Sir, Limited Past President IAPS, Governing Council Member IAPS. Our team, Comrade Marvels consists of two postgraduates. One is myself, Dr. Akasha Jadav, Dr. Arunima Sharma. Academia IAPSM eConnect shall come up with next public health update capsule 
very soon kindly subscribe to our youtube channel ipsm e connect press on that bell icon to never miss an update thank you